For this level, we're going to look at capacity planning. When we talk about capacity planning, we're talking about the upper limit on the workload that an operating unit can handle. So we can look at the capacity at a particular plant, and we can look at the capacity for a particular machine within the plant. So when we are measuring capacity, we are really looking at the production rate. So we're looking at how many units can be produced. When we look at capacity, we have what is called design capacity and what is called effective capacity. So design capacity is the ideal. When we build a factory, for example, we have the design capacity in mind. So when we, the machines we use, the layout we use, how we set up the factory is based, will determine the design capacity. So this is how we set it up, what it's designed to do. So this is the maximum output that can possibly be obtained. under ideal conditions. <clears throat> so let's suppose that we design a factory to manufacture trucks and we designed uh, the factory to make a hundred trucks per day at the plant. Now the effective capacity, the effective capacity is a more realistic measure and it's the maximum output that can be sustained. And it's got to take into consideration a number, th a number of things. So given our operating hours, given our product mix, given the shortages we might incur of materials, any scheduling difficulties, or machine maintenance. So while we designed our truck uh, manufacturing plant to, to do 100 trucks per day, we recognize that because our workers are union workers, they can only work a certain number of hours, and that we have to have shutdown time uh, for maintenance on the equipment. So let's assume that our effective capacity is 80 trucks per day. Okay, so we have our ideal, we designed the facility to do. We have our effective capacity, which is more realistic, that takes into consideration some of the day-to-day -day constraints. And then we have what we actually do. So perhaps today, when we went to produce trucks, we produced, let's say, 63 of them. And maybe that's because some of our employees didn't come in today, they've taken holidays. Um, maybe there were some additional issues today um, with a machine um, being broken, and so that limited the amount we could produce. So we want to be able to compare our actual, what we did today, to what we designed the plant to do, and to what we really can do on a sustained basis. So this will tell us about what we call utilization, of our resources and the efficiency in our production. So we're going to talk about utilization and efficiency momentarily. But first let's look at how we would measure production. So in this case what we're looking at is the number of trucks per day. But, but how do you figure out what to use as your capacity? Well as you look at your capacity planning you need to figure out first what kind of decisions when you look at your capacity, what kind of decisions will be uh, based on that capacity? So a lot of strategic planning, okay, pl uh, determination of how big our facility will be, those are big strategic decisions. And so uh, we're looking at the capacity for a longer period of time, two to five years. We can also look at capacity over a shorter range, 12 weeks to two years, if we're looking at more of our day-to-day uh, -day operations and the size of our workforce. We can look at our capacity decisions in the short term, so less than 12 weeks, if we're looking at how many people to staff this week and how much inventory to keep on hand. So we need to figure out 
our, what decisions we're going to make based on this capacity to figure out if we're looking at capacity for the medium, short term, or long term. We're going to focus now on long term capacity decisions, those that have strategic impact on the business. So then we need to look at how we analyze our capacity. So the capacity decisions are or have a great impact on the company. They're going to determine whether or not we are able uh, to meet future demand. So what we're going to do uh, momentarily is we're going to forecast demand, turn that into a capacity decision or a capacity measurement, and then compare that forecasted demand turned into capacity measurement to our actual capacity to see if there's a gap. So we need to know about our capacity in order to see if we're able to meet uh, that forecasted demand. We understand that uh, capacity decisions impact your operating costs. If your capacity is more than your demand, that is, you can make more than your customers want, then you're going to have a bunch of excess uh, product. You made more than you needed, which means we're going to have to pay to store our inventory. That means some of the stuff that we made is going to lose value, so we have what is called obsolescence. So for example, if we're a truck manufacturing company and we produce more trucks than our customers want to buy, now we have a bunch of 2017 model trucks that are just sitting on the lot. And over time, as technology changes and there's better models and better, um, more high tech where there's maybe there's new features, and no one wants the old model. And so as it sits there on the lot, the trucks just lose value. So not only do they depreciate, but at some point nobody wants them at all. So we have obsolescence. Well, it can also be costly if your capacity is less than your demand. If your capacity is less than your demand, then we're not making enough for what our customers want, which means we now have to pay overtime, we have to expedite delivery, It's quite possible that because we don't have uh, the particular truck that customers want when they go uh, to one of our uh, sales, that they'll leave and not come back. So we might lose sales altogether. So it's costly for a company if the capacity is more than demand, but it's also costly for a company if the capacity is less than demand. So the way to minimize your operation costs is to make sure that your capacity and your demand are equal which means we need a very good forecasting method to forecast our future demand. We need to make sure that that forecast is long enough term for the decisions we need to make. And then we need to analyze our capacity, so we need to figure out how to measure that, and so that we can compare our capacity to what we need to meet that demand. We need to recognize that capacity drives capital costs. So often what is limiting your capacity are um, the bottlenecks in your production process. So if you have equipment, uh, how much can the equipment uh, process or produce? And if you're going to buy another machine, that can be quite expensive. So capacity is really what's going to determine whether or not we're buying additional expensive equipment. And changing that capacity is very expensive because it's either additional equipment or we're talking about a whole new um, factory we're talking about expanding the size of our factory. And so because uh, these capacity decisions are quite expensive, we need to make sure we have a good forecast demand and a good plan for filling the gap. We do need to recognize, though, that excess capacity can be a competitive advantage. So it's quite possible that uh, when other companies are unable to uh, meet their demand, the customers will go look elsewhere. So if we have the ability to meet their needs, we have a bit of excess capacity for a surprise, sur surprise surge in demand, uh, that that can give us an advantage over the competition. So we recognize that it, there's a benefit to having a bit of excess capacity, what we call a capacity cushion. 
but we don't want too much of a capacity cushion because if your capacity is more than demand, uh, then you're storing inventory, then there's that risk of obsolescence. And so we need to very carefully manage the amount of capacity, have a little bit extra, but not too much. All right, so how do we measure capacity? Well, should we measure capacity in terms of dollars? So do we want to say that, you know, this year we made a million dollars worth of goods? Well, the problem with measuring in terms of dollars is that it's quite possible that next year you are making $2 million worth of goods, but you haven't actually made more units. It's simply that there's inflation. So try to stay away from measuring capacity in terms of dollars. So now we can look at either the number of units we produced, or we can look at the inputs, what we're using to make them with. When we look at goods, goods are measured in terms of number of units of output. So for example, if you're in automobile manufacturing, how many cars were made per shift? Steel meals, tons of steel per day. Farming, bushels of grain per acre. Okay, when we look at so that was for goods. When we look at services, it becomes a bit more difficult to measure capacity in terms of number of units of output. And that's because when it comes to services, remember that you often have different inputs and different outputs. So it doesn't make sense, for example, to have a hospital and necessarily say, okay, well, we, we treated 100 patients today, that's the capacity of our hospital, and the next day we treated 50. And to use that as a comparison. The problem is, is that people have different ailments, and so it's hard to tell um, how much a hospital really can handle in terms of the number of people treated per day. Depends on what's wrong. So an output doesn't really make sense for services. Most services we measure in terms of number of units of some kind of input. Now there are exceptions to that. So um, <clears throat> restaurants, number of meals per day, a theaters, number of tickets sold per day. So here there are some in terms of outputs. But if we look at things like um, hair salons, you can't really look at the number of people's hair you've cut. So they look at the number of chairs in your salon. So our capacity is we have 10 chairs in the salon and so we can look at on a given hour how many of those chairs are filled. Uh, when we look at the like a transportation, right, people are all dra traveling to different distances but we can look at the input in terms of the number of seats on the bus and then we can look at are those seats on the bus being filled at any particular moment in time. And of course we talked about hospitals in terms of number of beds. So Services typically have inputs as their measurement for capacity, and goods tend to have outputs as their measures of capacity. Once we know how we're going to measure capacity, we can then look at how well we are using that capacity. And that's going to feed into those later decisions in terms of whether or not we need to change our capacity. As then we can look at what capacity would minimize our costs and how are we going to bridge a gap if the, if the capacity doesn't match the forecasted demand. So we want to look at how well we are utilizing our resources and how efficient we're being. When we talk about utilization, we are looking at actual output compared to design capacity. When we're talking about efficiency, it's actual output divided by effective capacity. So efficiency, the definition is the ratio of actual output to effective capacity. And utilization is the ratio of actual output to design capacity. Well, let's go back to our truck example, right? We said that today we are producing 63 trucks. We design the factory to produce 100. And we said that given the fact that um, we do shift work and that we schedule time for maintenance, we said the effective was 80. Okay, So let's calculate our efficiency 
and our utilization. So for our utilization, we would take today of 63, and we would divide by 100. We can multiply that times 100, and the utilization rate is given as a percent. So 63% is our utilization rate. So how well are we utilizing our resources? Well, 63%. We designed the factory to produce 100 units, and today we produce 63. We can look at the efficiency of our company, in which case we um, today we produce 63 units. Given limitations that we can't actually be at that design, uh, we're only able to maintain about 80 per day. So then we have 63 divided by 80 times 100 will give us our efficiency. And 63 divided by 80 is, what, 78.75%. So uh, we're highly efficient, uh, when, but there are some limitations that are keeping us from being at that design, what we designed the factory for. So in our example, we found efficiency of 78.75 and utilization of 63%. Well, Statistics Canada actually keeps track of utilizations across industry, so we can actually compare that to a benchmark to see how well our company is doing against our competitors. So if we go uh, to Statistics Canada, uh, what we can see here is the industrial capacity utilization rates, and so we could actually look and see for manufacturing, for example, the utilization rates are in the 80s. Okay. You can actually look by your specific industry as well, whether you are uh, making machinery, computers, here's transportation equipment, also in the high 80s. So if our utilization rate is only 63%, uh, then we're not keeping up with the competition. If we're looking at um, producing um, cars or vehicles, uh, this article came out a number of years ago, and this was about BMW and how BMW is actually at 110% utilization rate. So how can they be at 110%? Well, they had defined their design capacity as two shifts working five days a week. And what they were doing is they were actually adding additional shifts working more hours, and so they were able to actually have uh, the number of units they were producing in terms of vehicles actually exceed the design capacity. Now, do you want to have a utilization rate that's over 100%? Well, it sounds good because it sounds like the company is producing a lot more units. They must be in demand. But there is a risk with having a utilization rate that is too high, and that risk is that you then have a burnout of your employees if you are working them extra hours, you're not doing adequate maintenance of uh, your equipment, and so that can lead to bigger problems down the road. So we don't necessarily want a utilization rate that's at 100% or higher. Uh, most of the time we're kind of looking for in that 80%, 90% range. In a previous level, uh, you manufactured jelly sandwiches. And so we could actually look at our capacity and then how well we were utilizing our resources and how efficient we were being at producing jelly sandwiches. So when we look at the process for producing jelly sandwiches, you'll recall that you, you took jelly and a knife and you spread the jelly onto two sides of the pieces of bread. You stuck the bread together and then you had to move the bread uh, from one location in the room to the other. So when we're looking at our design capacity, we need to consider what is the bottleneck in our production process. What part of manufacturing jelly sandwiches took the most time? So let's assume that what took the most time in producing our jelly sandwiches was moving the finished sandwich from one end of the room to the other. And let's assume it took five seconds to move a completed sandwich from one end of the room to the other. And we went for three minutes. So if we look at the fact that in three minutes, that's 60 seconds in a minute, so we're looking at 180 seconds, and if that's 180 seconds that we divide into the five seconds it takes to run one sandwich from one end of the room to the other, well, 180 divided by five gives us 36. Now, 
So based on our bottleneck, the most we could ever make in terms of sandwiches uh, would be about 36 sandwiches. Okay. Now let's suppose that, um, well, let's not suppose, let's, let's, we can't sustain 36 every day, right? There are limitations, things that are reducing uh, our ability to meet that design capacity. And these are what creates the effective capacity. So when we look at what creates the effective capacity, we have to look at our facilities and our machines. So we need to consider the layout of our factory or for making jelly sandwiches, the layout of the room. Maybe you had an instructor getting in your way when you were running back and forth with your sandwiches. Maybe there were tables and chairs in your way. So the layout has an impact. The floor space, the ventilation, all of these are going to reduce that from the design capacity to an effective capacity that's lower. All right, other things that will take that design and turn into an effective capacity include the product. How uniform is the product? Do we have to make slight differences in the product? Because that might be more time consuming. If we are making products that are all not identical, there are slight differences in them, then that's going to limit the amount we can produce and is going to make the effective capacity lower than the design capacity. The next thing we have to consider is our workers. Maybe they were really tired the day that they were manufacturing jelly sandwiches. We have to look at their skills. We have to look at their motivation. We have to think about absenteeism and turnover. Are we constantly, re or are we constantly training uh, new workers to do the job? So that's going to take you from design to effective if you're constantly, uh, your workers are absent, you're constantly having to train new ones. Perhaps you have planning and operational factors. So this would be hours of operation. These would be impacts of bottlenecks. Okay. And the last thing to consider is the external factors. So are there pollution standards? So we're limited in the amount we can produce at any particular time because whenever we do our manufacturing, it issues water pollution, air pollution, things like that. Perhaps we have uh, workers on union that are on union contracts, and so they get a certain amount of break time every couple hours. Maybe they get a half hour break every two hours. That's going to impact the amount we produce. We also have quality standards as well, so perhaps that we have to uh, do some quality checks. So every hour we stop, take a break, and we evaluate uh, what's coming down the, the line to check and make sure it's meeting quality. We see that with food, for example. We'll talk more about quality standards when it comes to food, uh, but there are criteria in terms of checking, uh, for example, temperatures of, of meat that's being cooked. So all of these will take you from a design capacity to an effective capacity. So if we're looking at our manufacturing of jelly sandwiches, uh, perhaps you were tired, it was lunchtime, you're ready for a nap. Um, there were um, bottlenecks in the production process. Uh, for example, um, I think one of the teams ran out of jelly. We had issues with, um, with layout of the space because you kept running into uh, to desks. And so that takes us from a design capacity of say 36 to maybe we have an effective capacity. So on a typical day, the max we could produce would be about 30. And then let's say that uh, today, when we went to make our jelly sandwiches, we made 28. Okay, So we made 28 sandwiches today. And maybe that's because one of our runners who normally makes the sandwiches or runs the sandwiches from one room to the other uh, sprained an ankle and wasn't able to move as fast. Okay, So we have design capacity, effective capacity, and actual output we can then calculate efficiency and utilization. So recall utilization is the difference between your actual and your design. And efficiency is the difference between your actual and your effective. 
and we can calculate those. So we can take 28 and divide by 30 and multiply that times 100 and we get 93.3%. We could find the utilization, 28 divided by 36 times 100 and we get 77.8%. So we could then compare that to the utilization by the industry. So let's just go and look at food manufacturing. So let's go back here to the industrial capacities. And I believe we have food here at the top. And you can see for food that it's in between 82, 86. It's actually been increasing over time. And you can see our utilization was lower than that. So if we were making jelly sandwiches, as a business, we want to figure out a way to better utilize our resources. And for this level, your goal is to figure out um, what your effective capacity is uh, for your food production for the zombie apocalypse, and then how much you're going to be, um, how much you'd actually produce on a day-to-day -day basis, and then how well uh, you are utilizing those resources. Once we've done that, the next step in the process is to do some capacity planning. So when we do capacity planning, we take where we are and we compare it to where we should be. So we need to look at our forecasted demand. How much are we going to need to produce in the future to meet the needs of our customers or for the zombie apocalypse to meet the needs of your survivors? And we compare that to our current capacity. So we need to take our forecasted demand, turn it into a capacity requirement, and then compare it to where we currently are to find the gap. And the next video, we'll look at how to do that.